Uh, we're going to read Psalm 133. Uh, Behold how good and how pleasant it is uh, for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessings and life forevermore. Lord, we thank you this evening for your word. We honor your word. Lord, your word says that you honor your word above your name. Lord, that's quite a, a strong statement. And we thank you and we value the word of God. Lord, and we thank you this evening. We have a great opportunity, even though we're locked down and maybe people are isolated, that we have a great opportunity in our homes, Lord, to be able to Zoom together, fellowship together, and to be able to glean understanding and revelation, Lord, from your word. We thank you, Lord, for uh, John this evening that's going to open the word to us. We pray you will bless him. We thank you for his family, and we thank you, Lord, for the revelation knowledge and the study that he, an in-depth um, study that he's put all over the years into studying and reading your word. And we just pray tonight at New Life Community Church that our minds will be alert and our hearts will be receptive to what you want to speak and what you want to do. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, John. Uh, take it away as you feel this evening. Thank you for being with us. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, well, it is an absolute joy uh, to be with you. Also, thank you. Thank you, Denver, uh, for the invitation, uh, for the honor of being with you. I just love all of this and I want to commend you for uh, going for it uh, in the midst of lockdown and using every facility that is yours. And, uh, I, you know, I know we would rather be together in person, but uh, this is a great way to be together. I was just saying uh, to your pastor that just before I came on here, I was part of my Zoom small group. We have a, a Zoom small group. It's part of our church that I hook into. And, uh, and that's a tremendous group. And I didn't even want to miss the first 20 minutes. So I had the first 20 minutes with them and then jumped in with you because it's just so good to be together. And that's our theme over the next six weeks. And it has already uh, been outlined to you. We want to try and stage this idea. One of the beauties about having six weeks together is we can take our time a little bit. We can slow down. We can look at some of the key passages. In fact, the passage that you've just read together, Psalm 133, will be our main text for next week. And we'll dig into that and have a little bit of a look uh, at that. But where I want to start tonight, the foundation really of our thinking about together is from the very beginning, from the Genesis account. And we're looking tonight at designed for together. And this is the creational aspect of thinking about together. So if you've got a Bible and you'd like to follow a reading with me, uh, I'm going to take a reading from the very first pages of the Bible. So we'll read from Genesis chapter one, and I'm going to read from, we'll just jump into it at verse 26. So this is the point where the Lord makes humans the first man and the first woman and then we'll read a little bit into chapter two and take it from there so uh, genesis chapter one verse 26 and it says this um, then god said let us make man in our image in our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and of the birds of the air uh, over the livestock over all the earth over all the creatures that move along the ground. And then it goes on to say this in verse 27, for God created man in his image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I will give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the of the whole earth um, and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food and to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground. Everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so and God saw that all that he has made was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. And then we'll just jump down chapter two, verse 18. We'll just skip down some more detail of the creation story there. And verse 18 says this, uh, the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. 
Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave name to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, or the man, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib that he had taken out of the man, and he brought, it, brought, it, uh, brought, him, brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of the man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife, or the man and the woman, were naked, and they both felt no shame. Beautiful uh, parts of, of scripture there. And uh, the reason we're starting uh, is because it's really important when we think about together, that we don't just think of togetherness as a practical issue. So this is one of the great dangers I see uh, sometimes in our conversation about togetherness and unity within the church, is that we see it purely pragmatically or practically. Uh, and and we, we say things like that. If, if we want to achieve our goal, we have to work together. If, if we want to make the dream work, then the team has to work. And we talk often of togetherness in terms of what togetherness produces and in terms of what togetherness, uh, uh, as it were, uh, allows us to do together. And there's nothing wrong with that, of course. I think that's really important that we're going to be talking about many of the benefits of together as we go along. But I actually think that's the wrong starting point, that when we think about together, we mustn't just think about the benefits. We mustn't just think about what together will enable us to do as a community. But we have to go even further back beyond that and think about togetherness as part of our actual design. Now, this was a transformational idea for me because if I'm going to be really vulnerable with you and honest, even as a young leader, I would often think of togetherness in terms of uh, productivity. I would think of togetherness in terms of pragmatism. This is what we want to try and achieve together. Therefore, we need to be together. And I always saw togetherness as a product, uh, as producing something that we needed to produce. Now, without letting go of that idea, because that's really important, what was transformational for me was understanding that together was not simply something that would produce something for us, but together was actually a fundamental part of our design as humans. And the reason that was so important to me was then it moved the conversation of being together away from just achieving something to an understanding, actually, actually, this is so fundamental to me that I cannot ignore it, I cannot live without it, and I cannot hope to be everything I believe I'm called to be as an individual without being together in some form of community. Now that for me was a paradigm shift. That was a shift from being with people to achieve something to being with people because that's the way we're designed. Mm -hmm. Did you understand the difference there? So, so actually that was a shift in me, which has transformed the way now I approach ministry. It has transformed the way I approach uh, my relationships and even my commitment to my local church. So tonight, I could have easily just sort of went, well, you know, I'm teaching tonight, so I'll miss my Zoom group. But I didn't want to miss my Zoom group tonight because it's not just, you know, a good thing to be in because I'm part of the church. Actually, I've come to an understanding that I need the together in my world because it is the way God has actually fundamentally design me. John Andrews as an individual cannot function to his full uh, design, his full potential and his full ability without being together, without actually connecting into a wider world. And that's something that has become foundational for me. So that's why we're going to take time to begin the conversation there and go right back to the Genesis account. Now, whatever way you read Genesis, and there will be people who choose to read Genesis 
as a sort of a picture, or there are people that want to read Genesis literal word for word. Doesn't matter. However you read Genesis, and I have my own way of reading it, whatever way you read it, the message of Genesis is exactly the same, however you choose to read it. It is an undeniable fact that at the heart of this story, we have an idea of together, or the language that we are using, or community, or this idea that actually something is created in the image of God that God wants to use for his glory. And we're going to dig in to that idea. We're going to ask three questions, which will hopefully set the foundation for tonight and in the weeks to come. Three questions are this. Who designed us? So that is a will really help us to understand why together is important. Who designed us? The second question we'll ask is, how did he design us? And the third question we'll ask is, why did he design us? And we'll, we'll take maybe the next half hour or so uh, to unpack that if you're okay with that. So here's the first question, who designed us? <clears throat> so look at what it says in verse 26 of chapter one. It says this, then God said, let us make mankind or man or humankind in our image and in our likeness. Now there are two striking ideas that immediately jump out uh, to us from that particular verse. I'll break them down for us. The first big idea is captured in the phrase, let us. Now, this is really interesting. God is speaking, and yet God is speaking to an us here. There's an us going on. Now, we need to ask the question, when I read something like that, I want to know who the us is. Who's the us? Because the us is crucial in understanding the design of humanity, because the very next statement says, let us make humankind in our image. So whoever the us is, that's the image we are being made in, if we're following the trajectory of that. So who is this, this us in this particular passage? Now, there are some clues in the text itself, and there are other answers outside of this text. So that's, let's see the clues in the text. If you go right back to verse 1, of Genesis chapter one begins with these amazing statement in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In English, it's 10 words. In Hebrew, it is seven magnificent words, uh, a statement of innate perfection. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And what's really interesting is that in, in, in Hebrew, the idea of God there, Elohim, is plural. In fact, it could be translated gods, quite literally. So, so uh, Bereshit bara Elohim, the opening words of the Hebrew text declare in the beginning, a literal translation would be in the beginning, gods created the heavens and the earth. Now, of course, we've come to understand that actually this is representation of God himself. But what's really interesting, that in the first name or label that God gives himself within the text, there is plurality implied within the word itself. In the beginning, Elohim, uh, God's, uh, God created the heavens and the earth. And then it goes on to say this in the first three verses of Genesis. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the face of the surface of the deep. And look what it says. And the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And then in verse three, it says, and God said, Vayomer Elohim, and God said. So you get this beautiful, beautiful picture here going on that the first introduction to God, there is a plurality implied within his name. Then we see this insight to the spirit of God hovering over the surface of the waters, and then God speaks. Now we hold that idea in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, and come with me all the way over to John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. And here's what John says in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's what he says. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Now, if we read on in John chapter 1, we know that word is the Son of God, 
become flesh in Jesus. So, so the Jesus we see is the word made flesh. It's the son of God made flesh. So suddenly by putting Genesis chapter one together in Genesis uh, and John chapter one, we've got this introduction of God almost in a plural form. We've got the spirit of God hovering. We've got God speaking. And John tells us that the son was there in the beginning. And in fact, nothing was made without him that has been made. So suddenly we get an, an, an idea that within this wonderful, magnificent God that we serve, there are uh, distinct persons. There's there's God that we, we then, as the scriptures unfold, we come to know him as the father. There is the spirit of God that is moving. And we see a tremendous development of that idea throughout the whole of the scriptures. And of course, exploding for us in the New Testament. And then, of course, we've got the son of God who we uh, have come to understand and love as our savior and our Lord. So what we understand by putting the clues together is the let us is somehow this amazing idea. That though God is one, within that unifying idea of God, there is a community, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, so here's the idea, and this is why it's so important for us to grab this, and, and so fun to, and I'm not trying to, you know, make a, an argument for the Trinity, I'm just trying to argue here for the text. This is why it's so important, because when that God, who is one God, but seems to have a community within himself, when that God creates something, what does he say? He's making the thing he's creating in his image, which will point to the idea that whatever he's making in his image will reflect something of his community DNA, either as an individual or as that individual part of the community. So I would argue from the very beginning of Genesis that our very creative order comes out of a God who himself works together. And when we put these ideas together, creation happens because Father, Son, and Holy Spirit work together. Redemption happens because Father, Son, and Holy Spirit work together. And so you're being given this incredible idea of a community working together in order to produce something. It's magnificent. But then there's a second little idea in that in that verse that I want you to see, he says, let us make humans, mankind uh, in our image and in our likeness. Now, in English, it sounds like he's saying the same thing twice. It's just a repeat of the idea. What's really fascinating, if you dig into this, is that the word image and the word likeness, though their meaning is very, very similar, they are two distinct words. So the first word image is selem, and it literally points that it can be an image, it can be a likeness. Uh, but what's really interesting about that word is it's masculine, it's a masculine noun. And then the second word is demut, which almost has exactly the same meaning as selem, but it's a feminine noun. Now, this could be a complete coincidence. It could be a complete accident, although I don't think so. But here's a magnificent idea. That is, this God, this community God, comes to make humans. He uses two words to reflect the likeness he's going to make, one a masculine noun and the other one a feminine noun. Now, that could be a coincidence, or that could be pointing, in fact, to this magnificent idea which is borne out for us, that God's image is in the male and God's image is in the female. And actually, both carry equally the image of God. And there is something dramatic happens when the male and the female come together, not just in marriage, but in community. When they come together, it is the completion of that God image. So God is doing two things here. He's not only making a community out of a community, but that community represents an element of the maleness and the femaleness, as it were. Of God himself. There is a sense in which the male and the female carry the image of God equally. So it's not that the man has more of the image of God than the woman. They both equally carry that image. Male and female were both made in the image of God. 
And that's a powerful, powerful idea. And so you've got two big thoughts there in terms of who made us. You've got the community of God. Uh, in, in theological language, we call that the Trinity, etc. And that's a that's a big idea that we've developed over the years. That word doesn't exist in the Bible as such, but we've developed that theology. But you've got this community of God who shapes humanity in his image and in his likeness. And that image is both reflecting God's community and God's diversity. That although God is one, he is three distinct persons within that oneness. And so when it comes to thinking about us, we are designed for community. We are designed in diversity for that community. And in fact, God has designed us to, to have us an, an, an aspect of uniqueness about us, but for that uniqueness to be seen and celebrated when it's brought together in community. Ironically and wonderfully, the uniqueness of Adam is seen when Adam is beside the woman. The uniqueness of the woman is seen when she is beside the man. When you, when you put them beside each other, we actually see their magnificent, glorious diversity. But of course, they are not just designed to be apart, they are designed to work together, just as God himself is, forgive my language, designed to work together. No one designed God, but you know what I mean in the context of this. So that's really important. That was a big idea for me, which was revolutionary. I need to be committed to the idea of being together, not just because I want to achieve something, but because being together is fundamental to the design uh, that I've been made because God himself is community and he creates a diverse community for community out of his own community, if that makes sense uh, to you in that context. So that's the first question, who, uh, as it were, uh, designed us. Second question follows on from that, and it's, uh, it's really, it really helps us with our thinking here. Well, I hope it does in this context. Not only who designed us, but how did he design us? Now, for this, we're skipping into chapter 2 of Genesis, chapter 2, verse 18. And it says this, the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, let me just flag up a little dynamic here, which sometimes exists in the text. Some people have suggested that there are two creational accounts. So you've got chapter one, where God seems to make humans. And in chapter two, we've got almost a completely different story. And actually, I don't think it's two creational stories. I think it's one story. But in the second part, as it were, Genesis 2, we are given something of the mechanics of that design in order to help us understand why humans are the way they are and why we need to function the way we function. So in chapter one, you've just got the statement of fact, and God made humans. That's it. God made them in his image, and you're just left with that. But in chapter two, we are invited into the detail of the story and how it actually works. And verse 18 is really magnificent as an insight here, because verse 18, a little bit like first Gen uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, contains a couple of big ideas. Verse 18 of chapter 2 contains three massive ideas, and we'll just touch on these. We can dig into these as we go along in future but it says this look at look at the way it's broken down the lord god said it is not good for the man to be alone i will make a helper suitable for him now the three three big ideas are in the phrase not good alone and helper okay not good alone and helper we're just going to look at each of those really quickly individually because they scream out of out at us now, what's really fascinating is that in chapter 2, verse 18 of Genesis, this is the first time we hear God saying something's not good. And it's really interesting. It's, it's at the beginning of the sentence. It is not good, uh, this particular thing. Now, the reason that stands out is because if you read Genesis chapter 1, and even in English, if you read it out loud, you can hear the rhythm of the text. So when it comes to the end of day one, it says, and God saw what he had made, and it was good. And in fact, you'll see the phrase, it was good. God saw something, and it was good. You'll see that phrase repeated six times. In Hebrew, it's kitov. 
It was good. It was good. It was good. And we see the phrase in verse 4, verse 10, verse 12, verse 18, verse 21, and verse 25. Okay? So you can see that. Now, even when you're reading it in English, that is a rhythm. You can hear that rhythm. If we were reading that out loud, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. You're getting the rhythm of the story. And so you're getting the idea that at the end of each day of creation, this is pretty good. So it's wonderful. That changes slightly. The rhythm changes slightly. The sound changes slightly in that when God gets to the end of making humans, the day he makes the humans on in day six, he says, and behold, it was very good. Okay. Behold, it was very good. And you get this idea of tov meod. It's not just good, kitov, but it's tov meod. It was very good. Now, if you were reading that or hearing that read, you're going, it was good, it was good, it was good, it was good, it was good. It was very good. And the very good would make you go, hold on a minute. Why is that very good? And all the rest was just good. So the very good, the way it's read, is supposed to get our attention. Because remember, most people would have the scriptures read to them, not just read them. So you'd hear this change of rhythm. And of course, what that's drawn our attention to is that the creation of humanity was very good. Tov meod. It was very good. It's at, it's at the top of this, this thing that God is doing. It's above everything else. And so we, it draws our attention to the, to the human creation here, which is amazing. But then we go into chapter two, and suddenly after hearing, it was good, 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 it was very good. Now we hear, it's not good. Okay? And that's deliberate. Uh, I think the way it's written <coughs> is deliberate for us because that gets our attention. And it's supposed to. It's supposed to grab me and you. And we're supposed to ask the question, what is not good? Okay? So we've had this perfect creative order. Now remember, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, the fall hasn't happened yet. So this is a pre-sin, pre a perfect world, pre-sin, pre-fall. So suddenly, in a pre-sin, pre-fall world, God's going, hold it, hold it. Something's not good. And that's designed to get our attention. <coughs> Excuse me. And actually, as a little aside thought for you, there's only one other place in the Torah. Now, the Torah is the first five books of the Bible. There's only one other place in the Torah where that exact phrase is used again, and it's in Exodus. And it's where uh, Jethro says to Moses, when Moses is trying to lead the people all by himself, when Moses is trying to lead the people alone, Jethro says, what you're doing is not good. This is not good. Low tov, not good. Okay? And that's the only other time we see that phrase. So we, in, in the Torah, we have, it's not good when man's alone in relationship, and it's not good when he tries to lead alone in Exodus. It's two brilliant ideas there that we really need to pay attention to. That reference in Exodus is Exodus 18, if you want to read it for yourself. So, so God is saying it's not good. That's grabbing our attention, and we're going, what's not good? OK, and of course, then asking the question, what's not good is answered for us by God himself. He says it is not good. And this is the second idea in the verse for man to be alone. Now, the word there in Hebrew is bad and literally it translates, li literally transliterates in English as bad, B-A-D. Um, so it's a really it's a really cool little thing. It only works in English from Hebrew. But actually, it's this beautiful idea that God is saying. The man is alone. Now, what does he mean there? Well, what he doesn't mean is the man's lonely. Uh, the man is not lonely. The man is alone. And the idea of the word alone is very powerful. It's If I could describe it this way, <clears throat> this is a bit gross, but let me describe it this way to you. If I were to cut my arm off and throw it on the floor, my arm would be alone. Okay. Now, what have I done? I have separated my arm from something it needs to be connected to in order to fully function. Okay? Now, my arm is still my arm on the floor. It's still my arm. If you looked at it, oh, yeah, it's John's arm, right? But in order for my arm to work properly, it must be connected. 
Are you with me? Now, that's the idea here. So we've got this paradox, this tension now in the Genesis account. God has made a man who is perfect, but yet, paradoxically, is not complete. Wow, what a thought there. Now, I don't think God's made a mistake. Of course I don't. But I think God has deliberately led us into the story to see that even though he is physically perfect and without sin, the man is not yet complete. He needs to be completed by something or someone. And it's quite interesting. You have this almost little humorous thing where the man names all the animals and it says, but amongst the animals, there was no helper found for him. I'm quite pleased about that, actually. So that's pretty good. So no helper is found for the man among the animals. So God then moves into a radical solution. And look at what he does. God takes out of the side of the man and makes a woman. Okay. Now, it's really interesting. The imagery is powerful here, and we mustn't ignore the imagery. So he's not taking the woman out of the head of the man. He's not taking the woman out of the feet of the man or the back of the man. He's taking the woman out of the side of the man. Now, that is an unmissable motif. It is, again, a reinforcement of an idea we already have that male and female are equally made in the image of God, that there is certainly in the Garden of Eden complete and absolute equality. There's no mention of leadership in the Garden of Eden, man over woman. There's no mention of headship. It is simply the idea of partnership and equality. You cannot get away from that in the context of the text. It's the fall that fractures the relationship between the man and the woman. And because of the fall, it says the man will rule over her. Uh, and that's a very, very powerful idea. I think something that wasn't in God's original design, but comes to us by sin. But I think that's another conversation which we might want to get into. Uh, but there we are. So, so the woman is taken out of the man. And look, here's the third part of the verse. It says that God makes for the man a helper. Now, that's one of the most delicious, beautiful Hebrew words in the whole of the Hebrew Bible. It's air. And the word here is one who comes alongside and helps. In fact, it's one of the favorite words that God uses of himself. Now, this word is used over 70 times in the Hebrew Bible. And it's never used of an inferior. It's always used of someone superior or equal. And of course, we have that delicious language in Psalm 121. I look to the hills from where does my its air come? My its air comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And so God is our helper. And that's not in any way pointing to his inferiority. That's pointing to his magnificence. So in this beautiful verse, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. We get these three ideas. Something wasn't good, even though it was perfect. What wasn't good was the man was alone. He was separated from an essential part. And so how does God fix that? He creates a helper for him so that they can work side by side. So that they can then, and this will bring us to the third point in a moment, so that they can achieve together all the things they were designed to achieve by God. Now, let me just say this before we move on to our final idea, and then I'll finish. Big idea within this is this, that the Bible celebrates individuality, but it resists individualism. Okay, I want, something what I want you to think about as a follower of Jesus. The Bible, like no other book, celebrates me as an individual, and it's celebrating a man it's celebrating the woman. It's celebrating both of those people in their uniqueness and distinctiveness. But it does not encourage or celebrate individualism. So individualism is where I take my individuality and then I make my life entirely about me. And therefore, everything around me, everything I do <clears throat> is all about me. That is an idea. Now, I know you've probably probably discovered this, but if you haven't, this is an idea that the Bible passionately resists. It passionately resists the idea that any individual is the center of the story. Always, always, always the individual is celebrated in the context of community. And actually, 
Uh, the idea of salvation and life and health is to be located in the community. Now, now in our Western world, we, we, have, we have made individuality a cult. We have, we have made the individual almost um, sacrosanct. And actually, as a result of that, I think we have drifted away from strong biblical ideas around community and around the corporateness of our identity. We're so convinced that as an individual, I have rights as an individual, I, I should have this and I should have the other, that we've actually put the individual above the community. And in a Bible worldview, that is resisted. That's pushed back against. And it is striking that, that twice in the Gospels, Jesus is introduced to us through the genealogy of all the people he came from. He doesn't just arrive. He comes to us through a community. Jesus was a Jewish person born into a Jewish home and part of a Jewish culture. He wasn't just an individual standing alone. He was part of a long genealogical line and he was born into a community that he was called to impact and save. And that's a very, very important idea for us. We are uniquely designed. Come on. That's an amazing principle. The Bible celebrates that. And the Bible says you are fearfully and you are wonderfully and you are uniquely and you are distinctly made. Amen, 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 and amen. But my individuality does not permit me to endorse that into individualism. I am called to live in community. Just as Adam was perfect, but yet not complete. So I, as an individual, am celebrated but without the community, I am not complete. I am not complete. And that is an important idea for us. And that's reinforced with the third question. And then I've got to do this and then we're done. You've, you've done great listening to me. Hopefully you're still there and, uh, and hanging on to the end. Third question, then why did he design us? So who designed us? We see the community aspect of God and that beautiful male-female diversity that he makes. Uh, in us. Um, we see how he made us in that uh, we're shown into the mechanics of Genesis chapter 2, the man alone, the woman coming from his side. And then lastly, why did he uh, design us or what did he design us for? Okay. And it says this, look, look at back to verse 26 of chapter 1. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, so that what? So that they may rule over the fish of the sea and then the birds of the air, uh, the livestock, the wild animals and all the creatures that move along the ground. But then that idea is, is almost repeated virtually word for word when we move into chapter tw uh, verse 28. So skip over to verse 28. Look at what it says. God blessed them and said to them. Now, it's really important. He's not just speaking to the man here. He's speaking to them. And he says, be fruitful and increase in number. And then he gives them three words. Look at the three words in my NIV version of the Bible. Fill the earth, subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the, of the, of the, the sky, etc. So almost a repeat of verse 26. Now look at the three words. Fill subdue and rule there are three distinct words and note this the three words the three directives are given to both of them not given to the man and then the woman sort of helps the man no no god speaks to them and he empowers them together to do all three things uh, and of course we we've got this beautiful idea in the three things first of all fill the earth now that clearly points to uh, procreation. So we understand that, that that literally is something that a human cannot do on their own. So in order for humanity to procreate, a male and a female need to come together in one form or another, whether literally through intercourse or uh, assisted medically in other ways. But actually procreation comes as a result of two becoming one, okay? So in the creative order, we've got God making one, then he makes two, and then he makes the two one. You get one, two, one. And actually procreation, reproduction, fruitfulness cannot happen without 
that sense of coming together. Now, in a literal procreative sense, that is true, male and female. But also, if we were to give a little bit of license and think of that metaphorically as a picture, then actually it teaches us that if we are going to be a fruitful community, we cannot be fruitful alone. But actually, we will be more fruitful, more dynamically fruitful. We will fill the earth quicker when we do it together than when we try to do it alone. And even Jesus, when he sends his, his young disciples out on their first sort of mission excursion, he sends them out together. He sends them out in twos. He doesn't send them on his own. He sends them together because he's trying to teach a principle. And we'll, we'll dig into this a little bit more in the next couple of weeks. The power of synergy, the power of reproduction that comes when two people work as one. It's a dynamic, dynamic idea. So there's a sort of a procreation picture here, but there's also a fruitful picture here within this, which we'll dig into a bit later on in our study. And then he says to them both subdue the earth. And the idea behind the word here is, is to literally dominate, is to bring into order. So the idea here is that, that, and this is a strange one for us, that life outside the garden wasn't as ordered as it was inside the garden. And so there's a sense in which the man and the woman are being charged to take the order of the garden to the rest of the world. Now, I know for some of us, that's a strange idea because we tend to think of God's creation as making the whole earth like the garden. But, but actually, the implication is God makes a garden and then he wants the man and the woman to replicate that garden across the earth by subduing the earth, by bringing the disorder around the earth into the order that is seen reflected in the Garden of Eden or the Garden of Delight, as it is called. And so, so you get this incredible idea. And of course, you'll, you'll hear the echo there of God's plan for Israel and God's plan for the church in that Israel and the church were called to be a community that would take God's order to the earth and, as it were, subdue the chaos around them. And so the man and the woman are called to fill the earth. There's something they, they can only do together. They're now called to subdue the earth, that is, bring the rest of the earth into the order of the Garden of Eden. And thirdly, and controversially for some, they are called to rule over creation. And the word there for rule is very, very strong. It literally just means to exercise dominion. It has within it an understanding of authority and leadership. And what's really interesting, and this is a different conversation, but something I passionately believe, that God um, puts into both male <coughs> and female the ability to rule. People sometimes ask me, can a woman be a leader? My answer is absolutely she can. Why? Because God designed her like that. So actually, in the very beginning, God says to the man and the woman, rule the earth. So that says to me that there is rulership ability within the female form of God's image that actually can bring something dynamic to the earth. Now, the point is this, even if you disagree with me on that, you can have a wee reflect on that. The point is this, God says three things to them, fill, subdue, and rule that they can only do together. That is the point. The point is, if you try to do this on your own, you're gonna, gonna make a mess of it. The point is, you've got to learn to do this together. And isn't it striking if we read on in the Genesis account that actually the, the master stroke of the enemy is that he divides and conquers. He separates the man from the woman. He separates the humans from the word of God. He separates them from the presence of God. His strategy is one of separation. His strategy is one of division. His, his strategy is one of fracture because every time he tries to separate us from the word, every time he tries to separate us from each other, he is going against the fundamental design that God has made us to be. And that is one of together. And of course, when the man and the woman separate, when the humans separate from the word of God, when they separate from each other, we see this horrendous fracture 
that takes place. And when sin enters the world and God confronts the man and the woman, you'll notice this terrible, terrible um, sort of trickle down effect. God confronts the man and the man says, oh, it wasn't me. It was the woman you gave me. And then uh, the woman sort of looks to the serpent and you've got that first fracturing process that takes place. And instead of ruling together, the man ends up through sin ruling over the woman. And, and I think we have then a human story that is not only filled with glory, but also filled with tragedy as a result of that. But the point is this, the Genesis account teaches us that together is not just a cool organizational idea. Together is not just a good practical idea. Together is not just a really clever uh, sort of community idea, but together is a God-designed idea. The God who is community designed us in his image. He designed us with both diversity and community in mind, difference and oneness in mind, which reflects his own, uh, uh, as it were, his own image and who he is, the one God uh, and, and uh, three persons within it. He designed us uh, in such a way that actually it demonstrates that we need each other. And even in the way he makes us, we are designed to be side by side. And if we can learn to live side by side with each other, something happens. I think we can fill, we can subdue, and we can rule. But actually, all of those things are crucial to an understanding that we are to be together. And I want to encourage you to think about that. Together is not just a cool idea. It's not just a slogan. It is fundamental to our design, and it is essential. If we are not only just to be successful as a community, but I believe fundamentally, if we want to be fulfilled, truly fulfilled as a human, we need to be men and women who understand that, that together is essential and together is necessary because together is how we were actually designed by God. So hope that helps you. Have a wee think and a reflect on that. Happy at some point if we want to have a reflection back or, or maybe in the next few weeks questions together. But, but I think it's worth digging into that beautiful text and understanding that we are made in the image. And that image is both diverse, but committed to community and unity in Jesus' name. Is that okay? Thank you, John. Yeah, um, fantastic. Um, great foundation uh, to open us up this evening with that. I think um, it's significant what you brought out there. Uh, one of the things that... Um, I know we've, we've felt as a church, obviously, and walking this together that we're better together than we are apart is going back to the foundations. Um, and I know that, um, obviously, you know, Corinthians refers to the foundations of the scripture. And I think that is great for us fundamentally as a church and individually this evening and a great foundation. Uh, one of the things what I think I probably suggest, if that's all right, um, John, is that people maybe go away, reflect uh, this week. And then maybe if they've got questions at the beginning next week on this week and so we have like a, a question q a maybe at the beginning next week before we get into the teaching does that sound a plan sounds great to me sounds great to um, me. so that kind of you know kind of dovetails together you guys have got um a week to kind of think about your questions and let it sink in and also we'll try to to get this out so that we've got be able to kind of watch the teaching and listen to the teaching once again tomorrow so we'll kind of get it rolled and edited and, and get it out and emailed out to us um tomorrow so that we can um have the next um, week to be able to kind of filter it and listen to it again and any questions that we do have we can to do that next week does that sound is that kind of okay john so i'm happy to serve you whatever way is best absolutely yeah it's fantastic so so really